Okay, thank you very much for joining me for this application tips webinar. Um, for the next hour, it will be myself um, doing sort of 30 minute slide presentations, basically talking about, you know, the requirements for the application, but also what you can do to make sure that you are distinguished in your application, that you're competitive in your application, and that you can sort of put to, to put to rest some concerns that you potentially may have. So for the 30 minutes, we'll do a couple of slides, really is only a couple of slides. And the second sort of half, it will be mainly questions and answers. So that Q&A function you just used, please feel free to use it. Um, you can start asking now, start asking throughout the session. I have a colleague in the background also helping answer questions. So if your question's not answered live, hopefully we'll get sort of a written question to you as well. The main thing we ask is that you keep your questions quite broad um, so that we can sort of answer to the general audience and that everybody can gain something from the information that we're going to provide. Um, and, and outside of that, then hopefully we can have, you know, you can email our inbox with sort of maybe particular questions about your candidacy or concerns that you will have. But yes, feel free to be interactive and to use the Q&A function. Um, my name is Hazel Watersend, to give you a bit of context. Um, I'm a senior advisor on the MBA admissions and recruitment team here at Oxford Said, which is in the picture behind me. Um, with that in mind, if anybody is, you know, it, we appreciate that everybody has a busy life and we're about to do an hour webinar. If you need to pop out or you can't stay for the full hour, that's completely fine as well. And um, if you've registered, you will get a recording to this at, um, afterwards as well. So don't feel like you have to stay if you if you can't. And um, we appreciate everybody has a busy life. OK, I can see the numbers have risen and it looks like everybody is potentially here. So thank you all for joining. Um, I will let's start with our first slide. So. OK, the MBA application stage deadlines. So essentially, there's three application deadlines that you can submit your application for in order to be considered for the September 2024 intake. If you were someone aiming for 2024, if you're someone who's really at the start of your research phase of looking at different MBA programs um, and you're looking to apply for 2025, you would start doing your application next year and apply next year. So hopefully some of the things that we're about to talk about will be beneficial about applications and the requirements. But in terms of stage deadlines, this broadly may not affect you. For anyone else who is considering September 2024 intake, these are the dates that you need to sort of um keep keenly jot down or note in, in your planning and your timelines that you're, you're going to reach. We have three this year. The first one is already passed. So that was in September. Um, and for anybody who, you know, submitted in that round, they would have already found out if they're being interviewed. And a lot of people um, will have, have already done their interview by this stage and maybe potentially there's a few people left to do their interview. After each stage deadline, there is a date that you will find out offer decisions and there is a date that you will find out interview decisions as well. So the QR code on the left hand of the screen really just shows you sort of the extra dates that you need to keep in mind when planning or submitting your application or just to jot them into your calendar. If, if you potentially think you'll have an interview or an offer or, you know, what, whatever else that you need to consider and jot into your in your diary, all them dates are listed there. The main question we get asked is, you know, there's three stages, but there's one intake. What's the difference? Which deadline do I need to aim for? Which deadline is the best deadline to aim for? And the answer really is there's not much difference between the stages. It really is sort of your personal personal preference. It really is sort of where you are in your journey. And um, in terms of differences, if we're being slightly sort of candid, I would say stage one and stage two, relatively similar. Um, in terms of sort of space available, funding available, um, you know, college preference options and stuff like that is primarily the same. They are usually our most popular application sort of deadlines that people choose. So usually we have sort of a bigger, higher intake in those or intake of applications at that time as well. Stage three is potentially a little bit more competitive. Um, the reason we say it's more competitive is the pool of funding will be slightly smaller. Um, it doesn't mean there's no funding available, but the pool of funding would be slightly smaller than other deadlines. Your, if college preferences is something that matters to you, you may potentially be, you know, some college places may already have been taken. Um, and and so, you know, you may not get the college preference of your of that you that you want, but you, you will still get a college place. So something to consider. And then the last thing and the main thing is I think 
with stage three, we've given it, we've given out a lot of places or lots of offers have already gone out. So there just is slightly less places available. Um, I just slightly want to touch on the collegiate system here because it may be something that you've not heard before. It's it's very unique to Oxford um, and, and also Cambridge, but within the UK, it's a very unique system to those two universities. So as a student of the University of Oxford, you would attend and do your studies in the academic department of Syed Business School. So you'll come to the building behind me, you will get your education here, you will go to classes, you will network with your MBA students, et cetera, within that building. But you were also a student of the University of Oxford as part of this academic department. And as such, you will also need to get a college place. So throughout the University of Oxford, there's 40 colleges. MBA students can choose between 34 to 36 colleges and you will become a member of one of these colleges and spend some of your time there or network with people there in, in that separate building and separate sort of bubble that you will have within Oxford. The reason I mention all this is that you will be able to pick one college preference um, and we will usually ask for that after the stage two deadline. So if you've got time to research, do, please, please feel free to do so. There is 30 plus to have a look at and if, if you're keen for that. So we will start asking for your college preferences around then and you will all get to choose one college preference. It doesn't mean that you will automatically be considered for that college or sorry, automatically get the position at that college, but it does mean that your application will be sent to that college for consideration. Regardless of whether or not you get your preference, you will still, of course, get a place within a college. So if it's not that one, there will be another one as every student has to be. So something else that people ask about colleges then is can you get accommodation through your college? And the answer is yes, there is an option to do so. So there's a few accommodation options. You can do it with your college. You can do it with postgraduate, the University of Oxford's postgraduate accommodation. And you can also privately rent. Um, in terms of stage three then as well, accommodation will still be available, but potentially it's harder to get a spot or to get your desired accommodation. So they're, they're main things that you need to consider in the different stages if that's important to you to sort of give a broader context about scholarships and funding, if that's something that's important to you, we would advise stage two, our January deadline. And the reason for that is that most of our scholarships line up with the University of Oxford scholarship deadlines, and a lot of them are in January. So, and, and you need to submit your scholarship preferences at the time of your application. You can't get an offer and then go back and apply for a scholarship. So please spend time researching and looking into that component as well. Um, but like I said, if that's important, we would probably recommend January deadline as well. So there are the few factors to consider when, when, when putting an application. But the main message we want to get out there and the broad message you want to get out there is please do not rush your application. This is important to you. This is something that, you know, you, you've spent potentially already spent time on your GRE or GMAT and you've, you've looked at everything else and got your references and you spent all this time sort of compiling things. So Submit your application when you feel it best reflects you and when you best feel that you will submit a strong application when you're going into this pool of, you know, it's a competitive pool of, of you know, amazing people from across the globe that you're going against. So submit when you feel ready. Submit when it sort of suits your professional and personal life. We appreciate everybody as an adult, you know, has lots of other things going on just this other than this just this intense application process that you're doing. So that's mainly the key thing to consider is when best suits you and your timeline. There will be spaces available at every stage. There will be some funding available every stage and everyone will get a college. So if you've got any questions about that, do use the Q&A function. I'm happy to sort of go um, and answer anything further that you've got on, on those three points, but they're the main sort of dates to consider. Next, okay, so application requirements then. What's on screen here is seven components that you need to consider. So a few of them are things that you will need to have, potentially documentation you need to prove, just things you need to have had sort of built up already within your life. And other things are things then that you will submit as part of your application. And maybe you need to start thinking about them now before you sort of dive into the application process. For anyone who's sort of already been on our website and done our research, these will be things that aren't news to you. Um, but I will sort of touch on the seven components, give the benchmark of what we look for, and then maybe embellish on how you can submit a competitive application. I'm sure you're all now at the point of like, well, how do I make my application stand out um, versus everybody else? Because everybody's, you know, giving the same few things. So do feel free to sort of take notes as you go on. The main thing that I will say, and if you've done research as well, you've, you've definitely heard this word before, but 
um, it, it speaks true to Oxford as well, is that we look at applications holistically. We look at every component within your application and we weigh it together. So, you know, if, if you're worried, I've, I've mentioned the benchmark for an undergraduate degree and you go, oh, I don't have that. Or I mentioned the GMAT score and what we think is competitive and you go, oh, well, I, that's really not where I'm at. Don't count yourself out. Don't feel like imposter syndrome. Don't feel like you're not good enough for Oxford. It's not the mentality that we want to get out there. We want to make sure that everybody has a fair chance in their candidacy. And um, there's things that we will see that you maybe won't see. So we, we appreciate that everybody has unique strengths that they're going to bring, um, sort of regardless of whether or not they meet these, meet these benchmarks. But if you do, if you're one of those people who has an undergraduate degree that's, that's potentially not as strong as they want, maybe when they were... 18 or 19 they weren't thinking about applying to an Oxford MBA one day and they, they just sort of phoned it in and um, we will look at your professional experience we will look at your GMAT and we will go okay this person's undergraduate degree isn't as high or competitive maybe as others but wow their professional experience shows progression it shows working with really amazing companies they show that they've worked on fantastic projects leadership potential um, and, and we will consider all aspects of that if you've got really a niche question about your candidacy and you're still not sure after I sort of speak today, do feel free to reach out to our inbox. So I will put, I will, the last slide will have that um email address and I will sort of point it out, but do feel free to reach out to us. Let's have a conversation about your candidacy. Let's have a look at what, you know, can we advise you to, to you to, you know, bolster one component and help your application process. You know, we're here to help you at the end of the day. Okay, I'm going to touch on each of these points then. Um, and it may be something you heard before, but hopefully we learn something new as well. So for your undergraduate degree, the main thing is it is essential. You must have a bachelor's undergraduate degree. If you have a master's degree, if you have a postgrad degree, if you've got a PhD, that's all completely fine. But as part of your application, you must upload your undergraduate degree. And um, sometimes people feel like their master's degree result is maybe potentially better than their undergraduate degree. That's fine. Please feel free to also include that master's degree or the diploma that you've done. But we, we need your undergraduate degree in order for you to be considered. So please ensure that is also included. If you are an accountant um, and you've done sort of the ACCA or the ACPA exams completely, fully completed them, that is also fine. We will also consider those. What we look for then is a UK 2-1, which equates to around a US GPA of 3.5 out of 4. We appreciate that we've got a very global cohort and that people take degrees, you know, all across the globe and they've got different sort of um, differentiations between them and, and how they're graded. That's fine. Once you submit your undergraduate degree, um, our team will convert it to sort of, you know, um, make it relative to, to what it is in a UK grading system or a US grading system, depending on, on where you come from in the world. So don't worry about that either. Professional experience then. We look for two years minimum work experience. That excludes internships and it must be full-time work. So that's a key thing to sort of note there. Um, our work experience then on average is around five to six years. This year it's six years average work experience amongst the cohort. It's slightly higher than, slightly higher usually is five years, but um, it usually ranges within, within those areas. Essentially, the range goes from two years being sort of maybe on the, the lower side of the scale and then the higher side of the scale would be around 10 years, 12 years. And we've even had people come at 15 years work experience. If you are at the higher end of the scale, then we potentially may have a conversation with you about the executive MBA. It's not that you have to do an executive MBA or you have to look at that side of the sort of programs team, but it may be better suited. You may find that you'll get more of a benefit being surrounded by peers that you can have maybe potentially deeper conversations based on your experience to date. Alternatively, if the MBA is where you want to go and that's where you want to focus, let's have a conversation about that as well. Giving you that gauge of sort of professional experience, you can tell maybe um, that our average age is around 28 to 29 years old. Again, that's the young side of the range is 22 years old. And the higher side of the range maybe be potentially around mid thirties. There's there's no sort of um you know maximum maximum age there. It's just more so about your professional experience to date. Next component is something that people have potentially already heard or maybe sick of already hearing, but it's GMAT or GRE. It is essential. We do not waive it. 
but we don't have a preference for whether or not you submit a GMAT or a GRE score. It's completely up to you. We really recommend that you trial both tests and see which test best suits you and your preferences and the way you take tests. Um, you know, they have different things that you may want to consider when, when looking at these tests and give yourself the best advantage that you can in, in a very rigorous sort of standardized testing world. The GMAT, we also know, is doing a focus edition. So essentially, they if anyone hasn't you know heard that news yet or hasn't come across it, basically, they plan to sort of retire their old GMAT exam. And, and they have this new one, which is called the GMAT focus edition. You can still take the old exam all the way up to January in 2024. Not that long left, but you can definitely still take it if you sort of prefer the old way or you've prepped for the old way. Um, but January, January 2024 is when that will end. We will still accept scores from the old testing system um, as long as they haven't expired. So you've got five years on your GMAT um, scores. So as long as they're within range and you know they're, they're, they're valid, that's completely fine as well. I'm about to tell you sort of the grades that we, in, or the, the average scores that we look for. With the GMAT Focus Edition, that's gonna be slightly different and potentially the next webinar we'll have a conversation about what that score looks like. But if you come out with the GMAT Focus Edition score that's slightly lower than what I'm about to say, that's fine. On the GMAT website, take a look. There's concordance tables that you can see of where your old score aligns with your new score. So there's there's a table to sort of convert where, you know, to give yourself a gauge of where you are in that system. Um, but to give you sort of currently what our GMAT score is, on average, our cohort's GMAT score is around a 650. Competitive GMAT scores, I would say, are around 690 or higher. If if you're going for a very um, merit or academic based scholarship, a good, strong, competitive GMAT score helps. Um, it's not all of them, but but some of them, that would be something that is considered. If you are someone who's either going into consulting or wants to work in consulting in the MBB firms, just note that GMAT scores stay on your CV and MBB firms want 700 plus. So take a deep breath if that's something that shocks you and that's sort of the industry you want to go into. You know, have that in your toolkit that you know now that's what they look for and that's where they look for. It's the only sector where the GMAT score will actually stay on your CV. And you may find the GMAT is something that you're perfectly fine with. In terms of GRE scores, then I would say an overall score of around 322 is competitive and um, verbal being maybe 160 and quant being maybe 160 as well. So somewhere in that range as well as what we look for. Moving on slightly then to your references. So your references is something that you will need as part of your application for anyone who's already started an application or is considering it. You will need two references. They can be either academic or professional. They can be a mix of academic or a mix of professional. But in, in all honesty, most people do pick two professional references because it's so long since potentially they were in, you know, an academic environment. If you're someone who recently completed a postgraduate degree or you've completed, you know, um, another diploma and you've got a really good connection or you've kept in touch with your professors or your faculty members, of course, use an academic reference. And um, it's just about the relationship you have with that person. Do you trust them to get it in on time? Do you trust that they're going to speak to your character? Um, and the same goes with your professional reference then. So a lot of people are under the impression, I need to get the CEO's reference. I need to get the CEO's email. He, you know, they need to speak for me or they, you know, she needs to speak for me. It doesn't have to be the top person in the company. It doesn't even have to be your line manager. It just has to be somebody that you know can speak to your character, your work ethic, and potentially speak to, you know, how an MBA would, would help you grow as a person. Can they see themselves? Have they got an MBA themselves or have they heard about the program? And can they see how they will, it will benefit you as a person? So they're the main things to consider. I think another thing and, and often a question, I'm sure there's already questions being asked about this, but if you come from a family business or you're an entrepreneur and you don't know where to get your references from, the options include clients stakeholders, board members. Um, if, if you come from family businesses, we, you can't submit a reference from another family member, but maybe you have a client that you've worked with for years and they can speak to you or you've got a good relationship with your bank or a stakeholder within your company, a supplier potentially that you can use as well. So there is something for everybody. Um, and how the references work is that you will give the your referee's professional email address. You will submit it. They will get an email with a link 
And this link will take them to different sort of behaviors that they'll be asked to assess you on. Based on the assessment they give, then they will ask, be asked to do a letter of recommendation, sort of elaborating on the reasoning for why they scored you the way they did. Um, but nothing should be sort of too crazy or outlandish. It's just important to note that your references must be in at the same time as the application deadline, ideally before the application de deadline to give you a bit of peace of mind. Um, so, so, you know, please have that conversation with your references beforehand. You will get notified when the references has been complete as well. And if they're not complete, we will notify you as well. Next thing that I will touch on is the supporting statement. So that's um, just gone down that way. But the supporting statement is basically the only part of your application that's an essay. It's 250 words max. And the question is really quite broad. It basically says, tell us something we don't know. It's a little bit more sort of formal than that, but that's basically what we're looking for. We're looking for you to sort of give us potentially an insight into your personality. The rest of the application won't really, it won't show who you are um, outside of your CV and outside your academic background. So it's a great opportunity for you to give us something that you know, you may think that would be interesting for us to know that's not seen anywhere else. People come at it from all sorts of angles. People will give, you know, a childhood story. They'll they'll sum up their professional experience to date. They'll let you know sort of really why they want an MBA and, and the reasoning for it or, you know, an inspirational moment that happened or something that pivoted in their life. And um, so really do come from it from any angle that you want and just sort of read it back to yourself as, and, you know, nearly pretend you're an admissions um, committee member and go, oh, yeah, I think that gives a bit of insight. There's also an opportunity here to address potentially weaknesses in your application, what you may feel as a weakness. So if you think, like we spoke out there, if you've got maybe a lower GMAT score, or a lower undergraduate degree, um, but you know, you had really extenuating circumstances, there's something happened in your life and that's not actually reflective of who you are. Maybe give one line, two lines in your supporting statement to address that, um, you know, or the space that you feel that it needs, but I wouldn't take up the whole supporting statement in just addressing it, but it's good to flag a bit, of, give a bit of self-awareness to the committee that you go, yeah, I, I appreciate that this isn't what you're looking for potentially. So that's the essay portion. Once you do all written components of your application, and there is quite a bit to do, but once you do all of that, you will submit. And then 24 hours later, you will get a link to complete the video assessment. So in terms of organization, in terms of planning, in terms of sort of meeting these application deadlines that we just touched on, don't wait until the day of the deadline. Don't wait until the 5th of January and don't wait until the 20th of March to hit submit. Try give yourself maybe a week or a few days before, depending on, you know, your life, your circumstances and everything else. Because when you submit all written components, you will then need 24 hours to get the link to the video assessment. If you're a person that's not used to doing sort of this online interface of speaking to a camera, there's no one else around, there's no one else behind it. I recommend giving yourself a good, maybe a day to, to mess around with the platform. So the platform is called Kira. It's K I or A. You'll be given access to it and you can practice and prep and, and you know, look at the platform and do a few trial things and do a few test things before you actually have to commit your, you know, um, commit to doing your video assessment. So I recommend everybody who's not used to using this, this level of interface to try do it and to become comfortable. Um, you know, you don't want nerves and, 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 um, take it, taking away from, you know, everything that you've put in so far. Um, so, so do, do, do sort of consider that and put in your time. Okay, what's involved then? So essentially you will do three video questions. So you will get the question. The two first two questions will be very motivational based and will be the same for everybody. You will get your question. You will have 60 seconds to read that question. Think about it, maybe gather your thoughts, write down notes, think about things that you wanna address. And then the clock will start and you'll have 90 seconds to answer that question. You will do that for so the two motivational based ones and then the last one as well, which is the third video question, but that one will be a bit more randomized. It might not be the same as what your peers get, but it'll be more of a traditional interview question, something that you can pull on your professional experience from. So everybody should be able to answer um, from examples that they've had in their career today or, you know, in, the, in their personal life. So that will be slightly a bit more randomized. And then after that, you will get a really random question. It could be like, describe the color yellow to someone who can't, can't see, can only see in black and white. So really outlandish question that really has to make you think it's about problem solving, creative, creative thinking um, and showing sort of how you approach a problem as well. So you will get that question and you have five minutes to type your answer to that question as well. But that one, like I said, randomized, not the same as your peers. And um, it'd be sort of 
potentially unique to you in that sense. That's everything. I've sort of gone on for a little bit. So thank you very much for your patience. But let's touch on the English language proficiency then. So if you are from a non uh, majority English speaking country, so if you're not listed on that list, there's three things that you can do. Number one is sort of the main thing that most people do or think about doing is an English language test. So we've two options here. We have IELTS or TOEFL. You can do that online. You can do it in a centre, depending on your country, your region, what's available to you. But you can do either or, or we don't have a preference for whether you do it online or you do it in person. Um, your IELTS, we look for a minimum of 7.5 overall and then a minimum of seven in each of the components. For TOEFL, we look for a minimum of 110 or higher. So that's the two English language tests that you can do. The second option is you can apply for an academic waiver. This one is slightly a little bit more tricky because you have to have completed the degree um, within two years of, of, your, of the date of which you want to start your course. So if that's a little bit of a mouthful, do check out the website, check out our FAQ page. It states it a little bit more clearly and it should state a little bit more clearly in our application as well. But basically it has to be within two years. If that is someone, if that's if you're someone that that meets, that's perfectly fine. What you will need to do is to get a letter from your university or institution, and they need to state how you were taught in English or the course was taught in English, and confirming that you attended that course. The course also has to be more than nine months in duration. It can't just be sort of maybe a simple course that you've done or um LinkedIn learning video or anything like that. The third thing then is the, is the professional waiver. So if you're someone who works and speaks in English in your professional day-to-day -day life, this is an option for you. Potentially you work for maybe a global company, um, a westernized company that only speaks in English or does their, does their business in English. Um, what you will need to do for that then is you will need to, uh, to have a one-page document and you'll need to give examples of how you read, write, speak, and listen in English in your day-to-day -day life. So again, that's on the website, um, but you need to give examples of how you do that in your day-to-day -day life. So that's everything application tips requirements there. Um, I can see questions are coming in, so I will get to them. And I appreciate that people are giving them as and when I say things. So hopefully we can be um quite targeted in our answers. Last bit I will say is um we're just coming up to sort of 30 minutes on the slides and I do want to get to questions. So just a few, few tips and tricks. Okay. So you've You've come to this webinar, you sort of want to get yourself a bit of an advantage. You want to know, put yourself ahead of people. What are your next steps? The next steps are download a brochure. You may have already done it, um, which is perfectly fine. Step ticked, that's perfectly good. But look at the curriculum, look at things that you're gonna, you know, be excited about coming to Oxford about, understand the collegiate system a little bit more and um, figure out the opportunities that you could get being here. And that will help, you know, when you approach your application, that's gonna help you come from an angle of actually, I, you know, this is something I really want to do and here are the reasons why. And, you know, find your passion. Um, and the brochure should give you a good insight into a few other things like employment or careers opportunities or the services available to you that may, maybe we're def well we're not going to touch on here. So, second thing is connect with current MBA students and alumni. Best way to do it is LinkedIn. They're very active. They're very reciprocal to people, and um, they were in your position once upon a time. And we hope that when you're in their position, you're also um willing to do this. But get a sense, get a feeling, see what they say. What did they do for their application? How did they get, you know, the foot in the door that maybe other people didn't um, in such a competitive pool? And, and see if the, the connection, the feeling of Oxford, of what they say is what you want. It may be slightly different to what the brochure tells you, um, but make sure that it aligns with what you want. Prepare for your GMAT or GRE. Hopefully some people have already started doing that, but we recommend giving six months, depending on your timeline, depending on your, you know, how, how free you are. I know it is, the fourth quarter for most people in business world. Um, and that means it's a lot of stress before it gets really quiet and peaceful. So plan your GMAT and your GRE as best you can within your life. We would say start considering it maybe six months before you do it, but three months of prep is, is potentially needed to get you that competitive score, depending on who you are as a person and sort of how, how you study. Next, register for webinars. Step, that step's already completed. You guys have done it, but we do have fantastic other webinars coming up and constantly happening. And um, if you register, you'll get the recording as well. So if it's something that maybe it's on during your work day, you can't attend it, um, you will get the recording. We do webinars and scholarships. We do virtual help desk. We've done webinars with careers. We've done an alumni panel last week, which is a great opportunity to learn more about things, you know, um, potentially where you can see yourself in the future and, and, and the community that we have here. So do uh, do register. 
attend events. So our team travel. Um, we are, you know, we have, we're definitely always in London, at least sort of once a month Um, throughout the year. We, we attend London once. So if you are in London, please feel free to register for a one-to-one -one and meet one of our team members in person. Um, but we do also travel around the globe. So our teams are, you know, just came back from America, just did a massive um, trip across, you know, um, Southeast Asia, Australia, Oceania. Um, so we are across the globe as well. Have a look at our events website. See if you can meet us in person. See if you can attend events and meet like-minded people from your, your own region and see, what, um, see how they are finding this process. And the last thing then is to start your application. So some people may have already started. Some people may have not registered or looked at it, but it is an extensive process, I would say. It's not unachievable. It's not... Um, it's not going to be the hardest thing you ever do in your life, but there is lots of things to consider, think about, and, and timeline, sort of prepare and organize. Um, like I said, get your references in place. You know, Do you need to do something in your career or professional experience to get to where you need to go next before you submit your application? So have a look and see what you will be expected to do. Guys, I really appreciate listening to me ramble for 30 minutes um and I really appreciate you giving up your time and and, and submitting your questions um I just want to flag here that the inbox that I spoke about earlier or the email that I spoke about earlier is on screen so if you've got really sort of after everything I've just said if you've got questions about your candidacy or there's something more specific you want reach out to us we're here to help we're here to have conversations so that is the email that we would expect um people to reach out to us on let me have a look at the questions then and I really guys it's it's all about interaction it's about the fact that you know we're here to to have conversations with you so thank you so much for um submitting your questions I can see that we've already answered over 30 questions um so thank you very much to my colleague in the background as well so first question is a great question and it's from an anonymous attendee who has said as someone um, reapplying to the program, what specific aspects will the admissions team focus on when doing the evaluation? Really good question. Um, first of all, well done for reapplying. If that's something that, you know, if the program is something that's key to you, you really feel like that is something where you want to be. We know how much work it is. Um, so we really appreciate that you've done it. What we're looking for is areas of development. So if there is something that you knew was weak or maybe you rushed your application or something you really knew that you actually could have done slightly better try this time around to to improve it so was your GMAT score slightly lower than you thought or you know did you rush the post MBA plan etc a key thing people are looking for is self-awareness so from point a point b you, you submit this previous application well where have you developed since you're going to reapply have you got better professional experience? Have you gotten to a sector that now aligns with where you want to go? Have you got progression? Have you joined projects that are bigger? Have you touched on maybe, you know, financial opportunities and you, you didn't have that before? So there's there's quite a lot to consider and quite a lot to do. And maybe something that you're already doing and hopefully you're nodding your head along going, yeah, I've already completed that or I'm already working on it or that's where I need to go. Um, and the last thing I'll say is your post MBA plan. It's a really important aspect research it more maybe if you didn't get to research it last time and really see sort of the opportunities available to you in the sector that you want to go to um, and really see the work that's involved in getting to where you need to go but thank you very much for your question I will let's have a look at the other ones So someone has asked a question regarding um, providing details of any research, publications and or awards. Does this encompass these completed during academic programs or is it limited publications and journals only? So in that part of the application, if you've done, if you've got, you know, um, work that you've published or accomplishments that you're really proud of, people use it for all sorts of things. It really is about what you're proud of. So if you've got something that's not necessarily been a published um, journal you can still you can still submit it if you did research during your uh, master's degree or if you've done a thesis or dissertation um yeah completely fine to include it in your application um and it, it will just sort of show the committee sort of a broader opinion of what's important to you and what things that you want to flag so someone has said what is the difference between elective and interna international elective in the curriculum so essentially the electives will be on campus in oxford um, and you will complete it in a classroom environment sometimes we do excursions trips um you know potentially going to london potentially having speakers come to us maybe it's in a different room or a different part of oxford so it, it can be quite interactive as well um 
but that would be, you know, within the UK, um, definitely. International elective in the curriculum. This year we have two, and one is FinTech in London, and the other one is Business in Africa. So FinTech in London would be in London, um, but you get to meet some, you know, we're in the FinTech hub, you get to meet some amazing companies and go on excursions like that. The other one, the international elective in Africa is about business in Africa and you would go to Africa and you would learn about businesses. So it's it's on, on boots on the ground and um, research and learning um, would basically be the difference in the international electives and the other electives that you can choose from. So I have a few questions about PhD students. Um, and asking about sort of is there research full time work experience? So. It's a good question and I have two people asking it. So um, you are amongst amongst a good crowd um, and don't feel alone in, in that aspect. But it's really dependent on the research that you do and the full-time work that you have done. If it's full-time paid work, yeah, that's completely fine. Um, if it's in an industry that like, it just really, honestly, guys, it depends on what the full-time work experience is. I would suggest reaching out to us at the inbox on the left and let's have a broader conversation on maybe um, your work experience to date. Um, the, the other question about being a PhD student is putting your studies on hold. Is this something I should clarify specifically in my application? Is it going to have an adverse effect on my chances? No, if it makes sense. If what you want to do going forward, if you want to pause your PhD and you want to go and do an MBA and it makes sense to you, that's completely fine. It just makes sure that it makes sense in your application that when you really go, yeah, I understand it and that makes sense. It may be something that's probed deeper at interview if you get to interview stage. Um, but no, it wouldn't hinder you in, in any way. Um, hopefully I've answered both your questions there. So thank you very much guys for submitting. And if you've got more, please feel free, like I said, to reach out to the inbox. Someone has asked about deferral opportunities. So if you could defer for one to two years, um, the answer is we don't do deferrals. Um, it's such a competitive program with so many applications each year, with so many uh, positions available that we we don't we don't do deferrals. So that should be something to consider as well. Please apply when you can apply. Um, obviously, if it's extenuating circumstances, something unplanned, it may be a very different conversation. But primarily, we we do not do deferrals. Someone has said, can you give tips on, or Ines, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but thank you for um, submitting your question, has said, can you give tips on how to write a good personal statement? Is it better to talk about multiple things or focus on one specific idea? I think if you write about multiple things, it will show who you are. If you write about one specific idea, it sort of shows who you are as well. So it's it's about sort of how do you usually write? What do you usually write when you come to an essay or come to a question? Do you, do you prefer to sort of give multiple examples and come back and tidy it up and be quite concise? Do you prefer to sort of have long winded ideas or sort of really delve on one topic? There's no preference from our side or from the admissions committee side of, of how you approach the essay. I would just, the key things that I would say is be concise, be clear and think about what you're trying to convey. And this is what I keep saying is, read it back to yourself. If you were on the other side of reading your essay, how does it come across to you? So you could, if you've got the time and you got the opportunity and maybe you're not sure, you could write both essays and see which one um, better suits you. But honestly, it's personal preference um, and it's it's sort of how you think the flow and, and all of it comes together. But re really good question. And I hope we've given you a little bit of insight into how to be competitive there. Um, Gina has said, what type of questions will my referees receive? I'd like to send them a list in advance so they can prepare when available. So we don't um, give details on that. Um, what we basically say is, or what you can tell them is that they will be given different um, competencies that they'll be asked to rate you on. It'll only be a few. Um, and based on those ratings, they will then be asked to elaborate on that in their letter of recommendations. The letter of recommendation isn't too far fetched from, from any other letter of recommendation that you would have um, been asked to, to do in, in your life, you know, in, in other experiences throughout life. So it's not something that they need to be sort of worried about or think it's anything extensive. It's really something that they should be able to answer having, you know, worked at you and had that per, um, experience with you. So hopefully that answers your question, but we don't give any more information than that. We just like it to be sort of a clean slate and a, and a, a one, you know, focus in on, on what the question is at the hand. But thank you, Gina. So Scarlett has said, if we're looking to connect with more current students going into specific industries, 
Can admissions help link us with them? Or does the school's website have a list of student emails that we can reach out to on our own? Thanks. And um, thank you, Scarlett, for joining and thank you for your questions. So the best way to connect with current students is LinkedIn. If you go onto the Side Business School um, LinkedIn page and maybe Steph in the background can share the link to the Side Business School LinkedIn page into the chat, um, you will see a tab for alumni. And the tab basically has every alumni that we've had at the program. It will, it will list it by program, it will list it by sector, it will list it by a specific job title that they have. So put in the metrics that you want. Um, it will include alumni, but it will also include current students it won't necessarily show you current students on where they want to go into specific industries as they currently haven't gone into them. Um, but it will definitely show you where they currently are and potentially maybe um, that's that's the approach to take it. Um, alumni will be definitely better if you want to see if they've come from a sector and they go into a sector. Um, we'll give you a broader opinion, but it would also show you regions if you want someone from your own region, see how they did it. Or if you're more sector based, you can also do that. But Yes, link, LinkedIn is the best place to reach out. And like I said, they're really active, friendly and happy to, to help um, connect with prospects. Like I said, they were once in your shoes. So someone has asked a question. Um, considering Saeed School as a one-year MBA, I was wondering for students considering to make a pivot into a new industry, how would that be, especially in terms of internships? Thank you. Um, really good question. Thank you very much for your question. So I would say, depends on who you are as a person. A one-year MBA is intense, and I'm not. I'm going to be very candid about that. It is intense. It is fast-paced. Um, but if you're a person that that works for and you want to be out of the, in, you know, you don't want to be with, you're happier being out of the workforce for a shorter period of time and that works for you um, or you're just happy to do a one year course, it's still a brilliant course and brilliant opportunities. Um, that's something to consider as well. It will be intense and it will be fast paced. So I think you should be someone who can plan. And, and if that's if you've got a really specific industry that you want to pivot into, maybe start considering that now. It doesn't mean that's where you're going to go and that the plan is going to you know, go completely um, perfectly. But having that in mind before you attend can be really beneficial and go, right, OK, these electives look like something that's going to make sense for me. Or I've talked to that current student and they said to trial this out and, and, and think about think about before you come where you want to go. When you get here then, um, sorry, actually, before you get here as well, 10 weeks before you get here, you'll have an opportunity to talk to the careers team. So you can definitely have conversations then about pivoting industry and, and you know, they can advise you on where you need to go and what you need to do. Um, if you want to do a pre-MBA internship as well, if you are allowed to do that within, you know, your work that you're doing um, or in terms of, you know, financial constraints, if you're able to do a pre-MBA work internship because that makes sense to you, something that you can do as well have your plan, talk to careers 10 weeks before you come. And then when you get here, there will be a launch week and you will get sort of um, talks from each of the sectors within the career development team. So they have sectors, they have a team for tech, finance, consulting, global industry, social impact. So if you fit under one of those sectors, each of them will have a talk. You can feel free to go to any of those talks. If you're coming from a sector and want to pivot into a sector, feel free to attend your current sector and the new sector as well. But they will let you know of, dates and times that are important in terms of structured hiring, internships and when they will be available. Um, they'll let you know of workshops that they will be doing, speakers that will potentially come, what you need to consider. And so it is fast paced, um, but you should get the tools and resources to help you get where you need to go within the one year. And then to sort of give you a broader or sort of give you like a more um, quantitative answer, People do it. People pivot into new industries all the time. Um, it's around 60% for a sector change. So do take a look at our employment report on our website. Um, about 60% will do a sector change, 50% maybe a role change. And then around 27% will do a triple jump, which is location, sector, and job role. So it is achievable, even on a fast-paced one-year program. Um, and then internships as well. You can also do an internship in your summer vacation term. And in your last term, um, you can do an internship. And most, most people do. It's our most popular option. So you could do an internship before, but you can also do an inter internship on the course. It's really dependent on who you are um, and where exactly you want to go. But hopefully I've given you, you know, some things there that that make you a little bit happier, and a little bit optimistic about the opportunities available on a one year program. Someone has said, do I need two years of experience on the date of the application on the or on the date of starting the MBA? 
Good question. The answer is two years of experience on the date of the application is what we look for. So you need to have had two years of experience when applying to the program. Someone has said regarding, or Jason, sorry, has said regarding the one plus one dual program. So for anyone who doesn't know, we also offer the one plus one MBA program, which is a very unique program where basically you can attend um, an MSc or another master's with a different academic department in Oxford. And then your second year, you will do the MBA program. So it's a great opportunity to have two masters from the University of Oxford and sort of have this bespoke knowledge base that you'll, you won't really necessarily get anywhere else. So as part of that, um, you have asked, would I have to apply to a second college for the MBA year or would I stay in the same college? The answer is the same college. It, it sort of gives the least amount of disruption um, to you. So we we primarily would say the same, the same college. But Jason, thank you very much. And thank you for your interest in the One Plus One program. Someone has asked me to elaborate on the MBA um, internship so I, I maybe was too broad in what I said so I can touch on a little bit more okay so they said can you elaborate on the MBA candidates securing internships do MBA candidates do internships if so which months and how does the careers team help with this do these internships count for course credit so good questions you will do your internship in the last term there's four different terms that you will do in your one year the last term is long vacation and that usually runs from the summer term, so usually from May all the way up to August is when people do internships. So that will be when you do your internship. If you choose to do internships, there's two other options you can choose to do. But like I said, the internship is usually the most popular one. If you want to secure an internship that's slightly longer, there is sort of opportunity to have a conversation with the programs team to have that discussion. So please feel free to do that as well. The programs team are there to work with you. They're usually very receptive to ideas. So if you want to do that longer, you can. It, your internship doesn't have to be in the UK. Most people go to London or they can go abroad. Um, it's just something that you'll coordinate with the careers team as well, or sorry, with the programs team. Um, and how to secure one is a very good question. So in securing internships, it's what you do. You network, you get the opportunity to network to people. You will get to meet amazing companies and people who work in those companies, working on cases, having network sessions across the, the, the wider University of Oxford. And um, the careers team will bring practitioners and speakers and people that you'll get to meet that you'll never get to meet again. Um, and then they, again, we'll talk about structured hiring and structured dates for different sectors and, and opportunities that they'll bring in people for those. So it's about you. It's up to you to get an internship. Um, our students do it every year and they sort of target companies that they want to do. Um, and then there will be deadlines and dates for graduate internships. So there is MBA internships in the likes of Amazon and Google and other bigger companies like that. They're competitive, but you um, they do do specific um, MBA internships as well. And you'll be given all the information for that. Hopefully I've answered your question a little bit clearer. So please let me know if you have any more questions about internships, I'll happy to answer. Someone has said, do, uh, does, is a minimum GPA of 3.5 out of four non-negotiable? And the answer is no. It is what we look for. It is the benchmark. We look for 3.5 out of four US GPA or higher. If you have lower, like I said, that is fine, but you will need to submit a really strong all round application. And we would love to see that you've got another component that balances that out. So a strong GMAT will show us that you're now ready for academic rigor of an MBA program. Um, a strong professional experience will show us that you'll be able to have conversations in the classroom and sort of bring your talent um, with you. So. That should hopefully that gives you a bit of peace of mind. Thank you for asking your question. Someone has said, what's the interview format like? Really good question. So the interview format will be, you'll do one interview. It will be online. You will book in a time and a slot that makes sense for you. Um, sorry, it'll primarily be online and online and through Zoom. And it would be with one person from um either an industry advisor from the admissions team um, that, that they're, they're primarily currently people who make it up or from the admissions committee. So it'll be one-on-one -on -one Zoom interview. There is opportunity to do in-person ones and we've only just started bringing that back. So yesterday, for example, actually we had an in-person interview day in Oxford. It was a great day. Um, and you know the students got to come visit the campus and have their their one-to-one -one, um interview in person. So it really depends on you, your timeline, if, if that's something achievable to you. There's no advantage or disadvantage to doing your interview online or interview in person either. So don't feel like that there is. Um 
in terms of other regions that we're trying to do, so we recently for stage one went to Singapore and also went to America. Um, so that was where a big reference came from. But for stage two and stage three, we will also try our best to get out um, and, and be in person as well to interview across the globe, depending on where applications come from and the preference that you do. At the end of your application, you'll be able to put in the city where you would prefer um, your interview be held. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much for that. Guys, really good questions. I'm just trying to make sure that I get um, as broad as possible. Someone has asked what counts, or um, Preeti has asked what counts towards strong professional experience. Really good question. Um, a strong professional experience, there's numerous things there. So how long have you worked for your company? It doesn't have to be. You could work one year. You could work five years. How long have you worked for your company? Have you shown progression within that company? Has your workload got sort of, have you got more responsibilities? Has your workload increased? Have you taken on bigger projects? Um, that's that's an angle that you come from. Have you climbed the ladder? Have you progressed within your industry? Is is your work experience with a really good, strong company that's maybe well known? It doesn't necessarily have to be. You could come from a family business or entrepreneur, but it's sort of your CV should show your achievements objectively and sort of um you know, show show how your achievements in a way that's easy to read, regardless of what your company is or where you work from. But yeah, I'd say it's more so the workload, your tasks today, your examples of leadership, your examples of progression. Um, there's 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 so many components that go into it. So just make sure your CV is strong and clear. Um, best thing to do is to use the one page CV template that our careers team have developed, and that is also online to make sure that you want to get across um your achievements to date. Um, in your professional life but thank you very much good question someone has asked another question about in or Nathan has asked another question about internships so regarding the pre-MBA internships can we mention that we rolled an MBA um, Saeed during the internship admission process if we've been selected up to stage two especially because your internship in the industry wants to resume and I'm sorry sorry let me try you that again Yeah. Um, so I think your question, Nathan, and do correct me if I'm wrong, is basically saying that if you already have an offer from the business school and you want to do a pre-MBA internship, can you mention that to the person you want to do the internship with? So correct me if that if my understanding is wrong. Yes, of course you can. You can you can say that you are um with Said and that's the MBA program that you will do. Um reach out to us or the program team if you if you need anything additional there to help you secure that. But thank you. Good good question. Someone has said my IELTS slash TOEFL fall short of the requirement. Is it possible to apply for the January round with the current score and then update them in the late January, for example? Um, it, uh, I would really recommend submitting with a strong, uh, with, with, with meeting the requirements. You can submit with your current IELTS score and your current TOEFL score. Um, if it doesn't meet the requirements, though, it may be something that is flagged during the processing stage um, and it may be something that doesn't make your application as competitive as others but yes it, you, you can submit and um, but your application will potentially not be as competitive as other people who submit with the um who submit with the minimum requirements but yeah good good question to ask someone has said can you share insights into the qualities qualities or experiences that successful applicants typically possess Really good question. So guys, everyone who submits an application is going to submit with the requirements that we just mentioned. So everybody has them. What we will look for then is behaviours. Um, do you have the behaviours that we would look for an MBA student as part of our programme? So what we're trying to achieve is that we want to, you know, the next generation of these MBA business leaders potentially going to CEO positions and top companies within the world. We want to make sure that they have, you know, good they're they are a good leader and that they got good reflective leadership abilities that they have so behaviors is leadership you might not necessarily have it yet but you show that you have potential to have good leadership someone who's hard working shows great determination and maybe in their work experience to date um ambition but you know not not too much ambition where, where it's sort of um teetering on competitive just yeah, so someone who has is, is hardworking and is willing to put in the time. We this is going to be an intense course, and um, exciting and fast paced and interesting, but it's going to be um something to consider. 
Are you intellectually curious? Do you have academic rigor? Um, are you intellectually curious is a key thing. Our class is so diverse. The, the things that you'll learn are so diverse. You're going to have conversations with people from across the globe. You're going to have different discussions and debates. Debate is at the heart of Oxford. Are you going to be a person who's able to, you know, look inwards, look at your point of view, reflect on what people have said, have a conversation back with them and come from all different angles. So being intellectually curious, constantly wanting to develop your knowledge base, constantly wanting to, to learn is a good point. Um, but they would be sort of, the three qualities that I would say that typical applicants or successful applicants have, and um, the list can go on and on. Um, the main thing is have a good level of emotional intelligence. We can see that you've got a good level of um, intellectual intelligence based on sort of what you've submitted. Um, but do you also have the emotional intelligence to back that up and to have an impactful time in Oxford and post MBA as well? But thank you for your question. Someone has said, um, I might not go into too much detail or, or say your name because it's a little bit spoke, but it is a good question because they say, if I have five years or more work experience in an industry like accounting, but don't necessarily have a strong undergrad GPA, would you recommend that we mention the reason for the shortcoming in the optional essay? And would it be helpful for this candidate for having a good work experience? Thanks. Really good question. It's exactly what I said. So if you um haven't got the undergraduate GPA, maybe you even did an industry that you weren't um completely enthused by, and you know, then you found your passion for accounting or wherever else you ended up, we will take into consideration your work experience till date. If you've done accounting and you now have accounting um exams, we'll take that into date into consideration as well. We will take your GMAT score into, into consideration. Do you have a high quant score based on your background? And um, does that all align? So all of those things will make sense. But it is it, it can be helpful to include it in your personal statement if you think it it justifies the space that you give it. If you think it's like it's a weakness that like, you know, that I think that I think I should mention and you want to sh show a level of self-awareness, I think it would be a good thing to include. Um, but thank you very much. Um, that is all of the questions, guys. Um, unless anybody, we have sort of three more minutes. Um, I really want to thank my colleague as well in the background who has answered 85 questions. It's been a really great um, session. I've really enjoyed having you all here. But unless anybody has sort of a last minute question that they want to ask, someone has said, can you kindly share the link to the Oxford CV format? So thank you, anonymous attendee, just getting in under the under the um, wire. I, oh, um, my colleague Steph is actually going to share it with you now. We've got two two other questions and we have two minutes. So let's see what we can do. Regarding the scholarship, do you need an extra application or not? It will depend on the scholarship, um, Wenjun. So um, have a look at the scholarship that you wish to apply. Some scholarships do require an extra application. Others don't. So have a look and, and do consider it in your timeline. Some, some, of them, some of them are fine. Submit your application as is. Others really will require you to, to think and do an extra bit of work. So someone has said how to prepare for Kira and someone else asked to talk a little bit about more about Kira. Um, so in, in terms of Kira, I feel like I've covered everything there is to know. Um, but maybe I can touch a little bit more about how to prepare for it. So best thing to prepare is to know that there's going to be two motivation-based questions and an interview style question. So, you know, think for yourself, you know, what is your motivations? Have that in the back of your mind. Think for yourself, what is um, a good professional, you know, a few examples you have from your professional life. Um, and then other than that really is just submit early, submit the rest of your stuff early and give yourself as much time as possible to play around with the platform um and to get used to talking to a camera another thing you can do is just open the camera on your laptop and start speaking Um, sort of get used to this weird sort of mode that we're in where you can just talk to a camera and there's no one on the other side just to try you know get the nerves and, and move away but you will have some practice opportunities you will have time to think about things um, and if you come across as nervous that is also okay we understand that you know people are new to this platform um but thank you very much for two of your for those two questions about Kira. I hope you've I've answered them a little bit better. 
Perfect. Um, guys, that brought us up perfectly to time. We've now answered 94 questions. Um, so I really appreciate everybody joining. Please do look at our events page. Please do look at the other webinars that we are going to have coming up um, and get involved. If you aren't joining any webinars this side of the year and you're aiming for the January deadline, I wish you the very best of luck. And um, we really do look forward to seeing your application come through. And for anybody celebrating the holidays, I'm wishing you a wonderful holiday, upcoming holiday season as well. And I hope the quarter four um, madness dies down for you shortly. But thank you very much, everybody who attended.